Time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, and good morning. Um, this question is for the Premier. Back in 2018, the people of Ontario will remember that this Premier promised the people of Ontario that he would end hallway health care. We are now more than six years in, and there are more people being treated in hallways in Ontario than ever before. On average, today we are about seeing about 2,000 patients a day treated in hallways and equipment closets. Under the former Liberal government, we'll remember that the average was about 1,000 patients per day. So I would like to know why this government has doubled down on the former Liberal government's failures. And to reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. So, oh, uh, Speaker, let's do a quick review of what we've been able to accomplish in the last six years and the plan that we have ahead. You know, in 2023, in January, we presented our Your Health Plan to the people of Ontario, and it had very clear measurables on where we saw health care to be expanded. So, of course, we all know about the 50 capital builds that are happening in our schools, in our uh, hospital systems across Ontario. In some cases, those are brand new hospitals, and in some cases, of course, they are expansions and renovations. 50 capital builds with the equivalent of $50 billion. That's real concrete action that we've been able to do in support of infrastructure and well. What else have we done? Of course, two new medical schools in the province of Ontario, in Brampton, Order. in the York region. Why are we doing that? We are doing that to ensure that we have the health human capacity. Member for Ottawa South come to order. Supplementary question. Leader of the Opposition. Well, let, let's go back to my question, Premier, because back in 2018, this government again promised to end hallway health care. Right? Now, I, I, it may be no coincidence that under consecutive Liberal and Conservative governments, Ontario has continued to have the lowest health care funding per capita in the country. This government is failing every day to deliver on the most basic responsibility of a provincial government, which is health care for the people of this province. But somehow, they're able to keep all their promises to their insider wealthy friends. So I want to know from the Premier, why is this government choosing to spend billions on luxury spas that no one wants and a tunnel that won't be built for 20 years when they can't get sick people out of hallways. Members, of please take their seats. And the Minister of Health. You know, I think it's important that we start to compare and contrast about what we have seen and what we have seen in previous governments. Under the NDP, you actually cut residency spots. And by the way, you were in Bob Ray's government as a staffer when Order. that happened. The Liberal government, Order. when they were here for 15 years, ignored the fact that Ontario residents were aging, that we had new Ontario residents wanting to live and work in the province of Ontario, and they want a family physician. We are doing those investments. We are making those investments to ensure that people can get access when they need it. You know, I look at some of the comments as we make these investments. Ontario hospitals appreciate the province's continued commitment to building a strong health care workforce, which will help ensure patients continue receiving high-quality health care at home. I don't know what you've been doing over the summer. I can tell you, I have been visiting hospitals. I have been talking to healthcare pr practitioners. They are seeing the changes and they appreciate them. Once again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the house. The final supplementary. Well, I'll tell you what I wasn't doing this summer. I wasn't closing emergency rooms across this province. You know? tell you that is not going to cut it that response from this minister because people in Ontario they don't need that kind of lecture they are living this health care crisis I want you to imagine for a minute being the person who gets devastating news in a hallway surrounded by strangers this is happening every day in the province of Ontario and let me tell you it's not just bad for patients imagine being the health care worker that has to deliver that news that way Imagine being a parent 
showing up at an emergency room with your sick child and finding it closed. It is happening every day in this province, from Sault Ste. Marie to Bruce Gray. I want to know from this Premier what the Premier has to say, broken promise after broken promise to those patients. Minister of Health. Imagine, Speaker, imagine where we would be today if the NDP hadn't cut 50 medical seats every single yeah. year while they were in government. Imagine where we Order. would be if the Liberal Order. government, instead of choke-holding hospitals, had yeah. actually allowed them to expand imagine. when they needed it so desperately. We'll do that work Order. because we know it is needed. You know, when I talk to uh, young mothers Bill, who say because of the investment in our pediatric care system, in our six children's hospitals, with $330 million dollars, it means that we have been able to cut all of the uh, access to surgery and shorten those wait times so that people aren't having to wait. I remember talking to a, uh, a grandmother and she said, by getting that cataract Opposition surgery, come to order. because of investments Response. that your government made, we now have, have the ability, she has the ability to volunteer, to read a book to her grandchildren. That's the changes we're making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Order. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, this question again is for the Premier. Yesterday I asked the government about these outrageous changes uh, to home care that have left patients and caregivers without basic supplies to manage pain, uh, to clean wounds. I was so deeply disappointed to hear the very detached, and I'm going to just say it, compassionless response from this government. They dismissed the concerns of patients and families. They said things like, oh, well, they'll be reimbursed, and they can visit their family doctor. Well, good luck with that. Anyways, the minister was clear that she thinks that the shortage of family doctors was not a major concern. So my question to the premier is, does your minister also think that this crisis in home care is not a major concern for this government? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, you know, I said it yesterday and I will say it again. It is completely unacceptable that people are not getting the needed medical supplies and drugs they need and their health care providers want to provide. We are working directly with Ontario Health at Home to make sure that any uh, distribution issues are being dealt with expeditiously. We are bringing in experts from Supply Ontario. We are bringing in experts from Ontario Health to make sure that this cannot continue because it is absolutely unacceptable and we are doing everything to ensure that this gets resolved very quickly. I will say that it is important for people to have access to get reimbursed if they have had to go out and purchase necessary medical supplies for their loved ones. It's the Response. right thing to do. Order. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what's really concerning here is that uh, is, is if the minister only learned about these horrific experiences after it was published in the Hamilton Spectator. I, I mean, did she miss all the letters from my caucus colleagues here that were sent to her office on behalf of their constituents? The home care supply shortage could have been anticipated and it could have been mitigated by this government. The minister needs to take responsibility. Yep. Speaker, why did the minister fail to confirm that access to supplies would not be interrupted in this ridiculous change uh, so that vulnerable people weren't left more vulnerable. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Health. Again, I will repeat. We know that this is an unacceptable pathway. We need to ensure that all of our vendors and all of our suppliers, regardless Order of where in the province they are providing services, do that under the auspices of getting it on time to the patients who need it and ensuring that they have access. We have directed the vendor to prioritize and, and expedite urgent orders. We know 
that they must do better because our patients and our families deserve better. And as I said, we are working full out every day to ensure that those vendors and those distributors are doing, frankly, exactly what they're supposed to be doing, which is ensuring medical supplies and drugs get to the families and the patients that need them in community. And the final supplementary. Speaker, what's unacceptable is that this minister approved the contract. Yeah. That's unacceptable. These are not minor issues that the government can ignore or dismiss. We're talking about palliative care patients going without medication to manage their pain. Uh, immune, immunocompromised kids going without antibiotics. This is no small thing. We're talking about the supplies that a husband needed to drain fluid from his wife's lungs as she battled cancer at home. We are talking about the medical supplies that a mom needed to maintain life support for her son. It is more than unacceptable. Why were these glaring shortfalls allowed to go on for weeks before your government premier took notice? And I'll ask members to make their comments through the chair. The Minister of Health can reply. The member opposite is absolutely right. It is unacceptable, which is why we have been working directly with the vendor in Ontario Health at Home to resolve it every step of the way. So when we see that they needed assistance with uh, distribution, we stepped in and helped with Supply Ontario. When we saw that they needed assistance, we were there. I do not support or condone or agree that this, must, that this can continue. We are working full out to make sure that this vendor actually fulfills the contract as it was written and as it was proposed. Thank you, Speaker. Order. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This government has been doing everything but delivering what Ontario needs. You just heard a perfect example from our leader. New affordable housing stalled. Two and a half million people without a family doctor languishing. And instead of offering real solutions, this Premier keeps trying to change the channel with political culture wars and gimmicks and a $100 billion tunnel fantasy that will go ahead regardless of any evaluation, financial assessment, or the feasibility study. Is this Premier trying to distract people because his government has simply run out of ideas or because it is under police investigation? To reply for the government, the Minister of Transportation. The NDP and Liberals were the same ones that said we couldn't get shovels in the ground on the Ontario line. They were the same ones that said we couldn't get shovels in the ground on the Scarborough subway extension. In fact, that's all they talked about, Mr. Speaker, is their opposition. They're all talk. They couldn't get shovels in the ground. But under this Premier, we are delivering on the largest public transportation investment in the history of this country and this province and North America, Mr. Speaker. $70 billion over the next 10 years. The Ontario Line will move 400,000 people a day, take 28,000 cars off the road. And absolutely, Mr. Speaker, we know what Order. going to cost this province. $11 billion a year, and we will build that tunnel. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this province is still paying the price for the 407 sell-off, I will remind that member. Last week, we learned a Hamilton woman had to go buy her own medical supplies because this government has neglected the home care system and created yet another crisis. This government has failed to invest in affordable and supportive housing, leaving vulnerable people sleeping in parks. You can't Order. even define what attainable or affordable is. Schools are flooding after every Order. rainfall because this government refuses to clear the growth capital repair backlog. 
This Premier Speaker has no money for the real priorities of Ontarians, but somehow, somehow, he found a billion dollars to subsidize a private luxury European spa. He found $4.3 million to fight an unconstitutional piece of legislation with Bill 124. How much, how much must the people of this great province pay for this government's and this Premier's incompetence? Members of take their seats. Minister of Transportation. Speaker, we're going to build for the next 100 years in this province. In fact, maybe the NDP should look at why construction workers are leaving their party in droves and joining the PC party. It's because we believe in building. We believe in building. We believe in building public transportation, $70 billion over the next 10 years. We believe in building highways, Mr. Speaker. The Highway 413, Bradford Bypass, projects that the opposition talked about for 20 years. We've got shovels in the ground, and we're going to get shovels in the ground, and we're going to do everything we can to keep this province moving, Mr. Speaker. It's about having a vision. Under this Premier, we're building for the next generation. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the great Minister of Transportation. The previous Liberal government ignored the hardworking people in Peel Region and didn't build the critical infrastructure we need. I constantly hear from my constituents in my riding of Brampton East that they're tired of spending hours of their day stuck in gridlock. Speaker, they want to see solutions, and they're looking to our government for action. That's why it's essential that we reduce congestion and get drivers moving to where they need to go. Speaker, can the Minister tell the House on how our government is building new highways faster? Thank you. And to apply, Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That member is absolutely right, and I want to thank him for all of his advocacy in pushing Highway 413 and ensuring that we continue to build the infrastructure for this province. Yesterday, we introduced legislation in this House that would help exempt early works from the environmental assessment process to make sure we get shovels in the ground in the coming year, because we know gridlock as is at an all-time high. We're losing. $11 billion every single year to gridlock, Mr. Speaker. And this party has a plan. This government has a plan. Unlike the opposition, who don't want to build, they've opposed us on every single one of our projects, whether it be highways or public transit. The opposition have no plan and don't want to build for the future. Under this Premier, we're building for the next 100 years, and we won't stop. Supplementary. Thank you to the Minister for that response. Speaker, Bonnie Crombie and her Liberals are happy to see Ontario drivers stuck in traffic. In her own words, she's never supported Highway 413. The people of Ontario deserve better, Speaker. Unlike the Liberals, our government's preparing for a massive population growth expected in our province. We're providing transit relief that will make travel more convenient and increase opportunities, jobs and economic growth for all Ontarians. Speaker, can the Minister tell the House how our government's going to get drivers moving in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. The Minister of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and we're taking many measures to make sure we speed this up. With the introduction of yesterday's uh, piece of legislation, we can nominate projects to be a part of the uh, highway priority projects across this province that will allow us to invoke 24-7 construction. And we've got a plan that fits across this entire province, whether you're from York Region, Peel Region, Durham Region. We're expanding Highway 7, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, as the member said, the increasing population growth we have, the thousands of businesses that are investing in Ontario because of the plan that we have put forward in this government, Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue to build, whether it's the North, the Highway 11, Highway 17, whether it's the 413 or the Bradford Bypass. We are going to continue to build and ensure that we reduce gridlock across this province, that we increase productivity. We want to make sure that we don't repeat the same Response. mistakes of the previous Liberal government, which was to do absolutely nothing, build absolutely nothing. We are getting shovels in the ground, and we are building. Thank you very much. The next question is the member for Ottawa West, Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. A safe school to learn in is the most basic expectation of a publicly funded education system. But under this government, parents can't even expect that. Our kids are in schools with floods, mold, crumbling walls and ceilings, poor ventilation, malfunctioning fire alarms, and doors and windows that won't open. 
And that's not even to mention the same kind of concrete roofs that shut down the Science Centre. So my question to the Minister of Education is, what's stopping her from delivering safe, healthy schools for our kids? Would you respond, the Minister of Education? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And our government consistently allocates $1.4 billion every year to schools, to, bo to boards, to renew and uh, make improvements on their facilities. That's over and above the regular maintenance. These investments are used for such things as HVAC upgrades, for roof repairs, for maintenance, for plumbing, electrical systems. In fact, as I toured the province this summer, I had the opportunity to visit some of our school boards where they are using those investments in their schools. I visited St. Hilary Catholic School in Red Rock, which received uh, funding for a new addition that created 23 new student spaces for their community. I also visited W.H. Ballard Elementary School in Hamilton, who is using our government's investment to renew and update its HVAC systems. I even visited my own elementary school in Coldwater, where they have used their uh, renewal money to make improvements to their school. Unfortunately, Speaker, while we are making the necessary investments in schools, we have some school boards who are sitting on millions of dollars in surplus. No supplementary question. If the minister really thinks her government is doing an amazing job, she will make good on her commitment to release the total school repair backlog so parents can judge for themselves what kind of progress is coming Last week, the leader of the opposition joined me at Merivale High School in Ottawa, a school which has failed to meet federal safety standards for lead in drinking water on 60% of tests in the last five years. And Merivale is far from alone. Nearly half of our schools in Ontario have not met federal safety standards for lead at least once in the past five years. This government is failing on the basics so badly that they can't even ensure our kids are drinking water without lead in it. Why can't you at least make sure our kids are drinking water without lead? Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. And as I mentioned, uh, boards like the Toronto District School Board, who are sitting on a $300 million surplus, I would hope that the MPPs across an opposition would reach out to those boards and ensure that that money is being spent on those schools to do those upgrades. But, Mr. Speaker, we actually have boards out there right now that Order. think it's okay for them to spend their surplus Order. on things like fancy trips to Italy, $145,000 of taxpayers' money. Order. I have another school board who thinks that it's fine members. to spend money Order. to go to a, a ball game, $45,000. That's taxpayers' money. This money is to be spent on our schools, on our teachers here, and here. our students. We are making the largest investment in education. And the expectation is that money is to be spent on student support and teacher resources. Mr. Speaker, we will ensure Response. that we are continuing. We are providing the largest investment in education in history. Next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. The Trudeau Crombie carbon tax adversely affecting every industry in our province. Speaker, our natural resource sector delivers the essential raw materials needed to build Ontario, from timber to uh, sand, stone, and gravel. But the carbon tax not only drives up the cost for materials, but it also impacts the entire supply chain, resulting in higher costs for everyone and affecting every, everything and affecting everyone. Speaker, while our government continues to support businesses in this vital sector by cutting red tape and lowering regulatory burdens on job creators, we know that more need to be done. That's why we won't stop until the federal government finally gets rid of this disastrous tax. Question. Speaker, can the minister share with the House what workers are saying about the liberal carbon tax? The Minister of Natural Resources. Well, thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question. Uh, you know, Speaker, last week I was up in Sault Ste. Marie, visited businesses using our great natural resources here in Ontario to build Ontario, and that includes Algoma Steel. And the member's right, Speaker, that 
These businesses are hurting from the Liberal carbon tax, but it's not just the businesses that are hurting. It's the great men and women that work at Algoma Steel every day. You know, before they go to work, they get up, they drive their kids to school, and then they head off to work, and then after work, pick those kids up, take them to hockey. You know, it's the driving community in Sault Ste. Marie. That's what you need to do to get around. And these workers, they have to get to work. They have to help build this province, as I said. So they're forced to pay that carbon tax every day. It's unfair to businesses. It's unfair to them. You know, if the Liberals really wanted to care about the environment, they'd support Response. our government's efforts, support the EV sector, support carbon storage, support the largest transit expansion in this province's history, cut the gas tax, support that, and let's get rid of the... The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, the carbon tax is making life more expensive for everyone across the province. It is not surprising that the Liberal members in the House, under the leadership of the carbon tax queen, are content to see costs increase. Speaker, our government recognizes that the hardworking people and business owners that powers our economy have had enough. We are taking steps to reduce the burden on businesses and deliver relief to Ontarians. Speaker, back to the Minister. How does the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax hurt industries in the natural resources sector and consumers across Ontario? Once again, the Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Speaker. And not only is the carbon tax hurting consumers across Ontario, but you know, again, when I was in Sault Ste. Marie, I met with our wildland firefighters and water bomber crews, and their quick response is essential during every fire season. And that's why our government added four new helicopters and a new aircraft to that fleet, not only this year, but for years to come. Order. But all those aircraft use fuel. And the Liberal carbon tax is dramatically increasing the cost of fighting fires in Ontario. It's increasing the cost of communities protecting themselves in Ontario. You know, from the workers helping to build this great province to the water bombers protecting our communities from fires, that carbon tax has done nothing to reduce emissions and everything to reduce the cost of living and even the cost of safety. Speaker, the case couldn't Order. be more clear. We need to scrap that Liberal carbon tax. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier, local nurses, frontline staff, and patients have been calling my office in panic for weeks because medical supply shortages in Niagara are so severe that patients are at serious risk. We have reports of towels being used to bind wounds for days because there are no bandages or gauze available. Frontline healthcare workers are scrambling to buy medical supplies on Amazon. If the government can't get the basics right, Speaker, if we can't even make sure people have access to basic medical supplies like gauze, how can anyone trust this health minister to get anything right? Minister of Health. Speaker, I want to be clear. There is no world where it is acceptable for patients who are in home ensuring that they get those medical supplies and drugs. We are working directly with Ontario Health at Home with the vendor to make sure that this situation is resolved as quickly as possible. We are telling them, we have directed them, that they must focus and prioritize individuals who are palliative or have drugs that need to be supplied. I cannot be more clear. I agree with the member opposite. It is unacceptable, which is why we have been working as soon as we realized there was a distribution issue to make sure that this was resolved with this vendor. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Home care is supposed to mean that people get nursing care that they need at home. That used to include medical supplies. This Premier's home care system has become BYOB, buy your own bandages. And Sandra is an elderly home care patient in Oshawa who was made to spend $700 on her own catheters and ostomy bags. So my question is, should home care patients expect to pay out of pocket for medical supplies or are you going to pay Sandra back for her catheters? Again, I'll ask members to make the comments to the chair. The Minister of Health may reply. Uh, I very clearly have shared and directed that any individual family, patient or caregiver who purchased medical supplies 
will be reimbursed because we know that it is not acceptable. We know that people are going to proactively make sure that their family members get the necessary supplies, but we also know that that must be covered and we have set up a process to ensure that they can do that. I think at the core, we have to get back to the patients and understand that we want to ensure that those patients get the services and the supplies. And when we make investments in home care, when we make investments in ensuring that PSWs get appropriately compensated, we are ensuring Order. that individuals have access to home care and community care, just as they do in hospitals and with our primary care providers. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Across Ontario, including my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, we are facing a critical shortage of doctors, especially in underserved areas. This forces more people to the ER as their conditions get worse. I visited an ER and I saw the devastation. Under this Premier, there are over 2,000 patients per day who are being treated in hallways entrances and stairwells. This so shortage is placing an unsustainable strain on our healthcare system, leading to longer wait times, crowded ERs, and leaving Ontarians without critical uh, care. So, Premier, how can you say you're fixing healthcare while under this government, the number of people unable to even get a room in a hospital has doubled and 2.5 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor? <laughs> Again, I'll ask members to make their comments to the chair, the Minister of Health. Speaker, I understand that the member opposite was not a member of the Liberal Party at the time, but in 2015, your government, under a Liberal government, eliminated 50 medical residency positions. What does that actually mean, Speaker? It means that 450 physicians were not trained in the province of Ontario because the Liberal government made a choice. We have made order. a choice to expand medical schools in the province. Independent of members come to order. We have made a choice to expand the uh, Scarborough Health Network to make here, here. sure that they have access. We're making the job, we're getting the job done because frankly, for too many what years, we through. saw people and we saw governments ignore what we all saw coming, which was an aging population. Response and a population that continued to increase. You didn't make the investments. We're getting it done with medical... The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, why long-term strategies are necessary? The 2.5 million Ontarians cannot, cannot wait without a family doctor. By 2026, that will rise to 4.4 million, or one in three Ontarians will be left without care. Patients are experiencing a scary reality, and healthcare workers are burning out. You have an opportunity to take ownership of a failing healthcare system that you neglected. We need public funded, physician-led, team-based care to improve the retention of health care workers and to ensure sustainable quality care for Ontarians. Again, how can the Premier say they are addressing shortage of doctors, but under their Conservative government, the number of Ontarians without a family doctor is higher than ever and doesn't show Question. any signs of slowing down? Order. The House will come to order. 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 Clock's ticking. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to ask the, the member from Scarborough. Where were their government for 15 years when people are in desperate need of building a Scarborough hospital? They didn't fund it. And then when we put it forward, they voted against it. Where were they when we created 3,500 more acute care beds? What they have voted against, Mr. Speaker. We've registered to over 80,000 nurses that they were against. Now, remember back in the Liberal days, they fired nurses. A long help with the NDP and the Liberals, you fired nurses. Order. We've registered 80,000. We've registered over 12,500 doctors. We've increased Order. 
We've increased the seats at the metal, medical for school Scarborough, Gildwood, in Scarborough. We built a subway, building a subway in Scarborough. They had 15 years to build it, but your party Ottawa kept South ignoring Condor, the people of Scarborough. Center, Scarborough Condor. are no longer being ignored. Response. They have a voice for the first time down at the province. We're making sure, we're, we're making sure that we have more long-term care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and uh, First Nations Economic Reconciliation. The economic potential of Indigenous communities in Ontario is vast and diverse, from resource development, clean energy, tourism, and innovation. Despite this potential, many Indigenous communities still face significant barriers, such as lack of infrastructure, limited to capital, and challenges in navigating complex regulatory environments. While our government has made uh, critical investments in skilled trades, training facilities throughout the Skilled Trades Development Fund, many communities still need additional support. Economic reconciliation is crucial principle in governments to continue building better relationships with Indigenous communities to ensure respectful Question. a collaborative future. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government enhances Indigenous economic development across the province? Good question. The parliamentary assistant and member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. As parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and First Nations Economic Reconciliation, as well as the Minister of Northern Development, this is top of mind for us. For Hamilton Mountain, Speaker, come to order. Just last week, I had the pleasure of speaking at this year's Indigenomics Conference, an annual conference that serves as an invitation for change makers, innovators, and leadership across corporate Canada, the financial sector, governments, and Indigenous businesses to bring focus meaning and visibility to the strength of the Indigenous economy and build bridges for impactful outcomes in economic reconciliation. Did you know, Speaker, Indigenous economies across Canada are projected to reach a $100 billion valuation sooner than expected. And Speaker, Ontario is doing its part to help them get there. We are doing this through the Indigenous Economic Development Fund, the Resource Revenue Response. Sharing Agreements, and the Indigenous Community Capital Grants Fund and through our work identifying economic opportunities at various relationship building tables. I look Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you to the parliamentary assistant for his answer. Speaker, economic reconciliation is more than financial investment. It is about building true partnerships based on mutual respect and understanding. Access to education, training, and capacity building initiatives is essential for Indigenous communities to engage fully in economic development opportunities. Yet many Indigenous communities in Ontario still lack adequate access to these vital resources. Without proper skills development and training, it becomes dif difficult for these communities to participate and benefit from vital economic sectors. When everyone has the ability to participate in our economic in a full and meaningful way, our province and econo economy are more robust and better for everyone. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant elaborate uh, further on what government programs provided much needed investment for Indigenous workers? Again, the parliamentary assistant, member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you again for the question. Speaker, our government is on the right track when it comes to First Nations economic development. We recently announced $9.2 million in grants and funding to support economic development in Indigenous communities. These 48 projects that are receiving support through three initiatives, the Indigenous Community Capital Grant Program and the Indigenous Economic Development Fund's Economic Diversification and Regional Partnership Grants. And, Speaker, in my riding, this funding will support Six Nations of the Grand River in developing the detailed design of a learning and development centre. In Kosheshawan First Nation, it means an investment in, into a feasibility study for a community training centre in the riding of Meshkigawak, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, 
the member opposite has an opportunity to support First Nations workers in his riding. And my question to him is, Speaker, will he? Thank you. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. A global news report revealed the Conservatives were about to permit fourplexes as of right to spur the construction of housing in towns and cities to make it quicker and easier to build more housing for people to rent and buy. But the Conservatives at the last minute couldn't find the courage to make this zoning change. It's a low bar to meet and you couldn't meet it. My question to the Premier, what is stopping the Conservatives from permitting fourplexes as of right to help people find a home they can afford to rent or buy? Again, remind the members to make their comments through the chair, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, look, uh, I think I've, uh, I've answered this on a number of occasions. As the member knows, uh, I think uh, a vast majority of the province, 80 percent of the province, has uh, as of right four already. Uh, we have not seen the results, of course, that have come with uh, uh, with uh, both uh, additional residential units or as of uh, as of right for what we are uh, hearing from uh, the development uh, and the home building community and from those who want to buy their first home is that the rapid increase in interest rates priced people out of the market and priced home builders out of the uh, uh, from the ability to actually get shovels in the ground uh, we're also hearing from a lot of the home builders that uh, the challenges that they're facing with different rules and different municipalities is making it even more difficult for them to get shovels in the ground. It's something that we are working very closely with municipalities with. We've told them that we will work uh, cooperatively, but we will <laughs> act Response. unilaterally if we have to uh, in order to end the, uh, the obstacles and the, end, uh, the red tape to get shovels in the ground. I am encouraged that interest rates are coming down, but more work needs to be done so that people can afford to buy their first home. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Back to the Minister. The fact is, whatever you're doing is not good enough because Ontario is not building enough homes to meet the need, and housing has never been more expensive to rent or buy. The Global News report also showed the government was finally looking at increasing density and permitting more apartments and condos near transit stations. But at the last minute, the Conservatives backed down. Again, I ask, what is stopping this government from moving ahead with allowing more condos and apartments near transit stations so more people can find a home? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, the, uh, uh, the Minister of Infrastructure has a number of transit-oriented communities uh, uh, that she has been uh, negotiating with, uh, with home builders. Uh, uh, speaker, as you will know, the new uh, provincial planning statement uh, uh, encourages uh, that development as well. It, in fact, that is the document that will guide the construction of new homes along our major transit station uh, areas. In, a, in, a, in cooperation with the work that the Minister of Infrastructure is doing. But let's look at what the member opposite is saying. We have said all along that when you increase costs, when you increase taxes, when you make it more expensive for people, that things become more difficult. It becomes more difficult to build homes. It becomes more difficult for people to buy their first home. The policies of the, uh, of the NDP and the Liberals are just that. It's about more fees. It's about higher costs. When you run massive deficits, that leads to higher interest rates. And we saw the greatest increase in interest rates because Spons. of the failure policies of the federal Liberal government, supported by this crew over here, Mr. Speaker. Finally, led by the Premier, interest rates are starting to come down, and we're going to start to see more people in the market. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Residents in my riding are concerned about a proposal to deposit radioactive material and mine tailings from the former Bocage mine to the Agnew Lake tailings management area. Neither the Township of Nairn and Hyman or Baldwin were consulted before this plan was announced by the government, nor were First Nations, whose traditional territories are on. In a response my office received, the Minister of Mines said that Indigenous communities have been consulted. However, Ogima Corbiere of Andik Omnikaning and Ogima Nawigabo from Whitefish River First Nation have both made it clear that their communities were blindsided by this project. Speaker, this project has been under consideration for over a decade, but somehow there was no time to consult with communities and all First Nations who will be directly Question. impacted by the work. My question to the Premier, why did this government fail so miserably to consult and inform the public about this project? To reply, the Minister of Mines. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Speaker. 
The Ministry of Transportation is partnering with Nipissing First Nation and Indigenous Service Canada on a mutually beneficial project to move niobium waste from the former Bokash Mining Company tailing site to the Agni Lake Mining Tailings Management Area, operated by the Ministry of Mines in Hyman Township. The niobium rec relocation was assessed under the MTO's class environmental assessment, which found the addition of the niobium waste material to the Agnew Lake Tailings Mining Area would not create any environmental or public health and safety risk here, here. and would, in fact, improve the here. site. Yes. That's what, how we run our business, with full consulta consultation with all the Indigenous communities. Thank you. Supplementary question. Minister. Your ministry openly admitted to community members at a public session that they failed to publicly consult with the people that are there. Not only are these communities saying that there was no consultation, but they have serious concerns about bringing mine waste to this area. According to information from Ministry of Mines, MTO, and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, detailings will include radioactive niobium and uranium, as well as other hazardous heavy metals. Agnew Lake it is a critical source of drinking water for surrounding and downstream communities. Communities such as Naren Centre, McCarrow, Baldwin, Espanola, Webwood, Massey, and several neighbouring First Nations communities, as well as many people who have seasonal properties or use the waterways for recreation. Baldwin, as well as Nair and Hyman, have passed a joint resolution Question. calling on the government to halt this project and remediate the tailings area with clean materials that do not pose threat to the environment or health. Premier, will your government honour their resolution and confirm that this project will not move forward? Again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Mines. In June 24, Mines provided the Township of Naren Hyman with the project information on details, including ministry contact information. Recently, MTO reached out to both townships mayors and offered to provide additional information that could be shared with the public. The Township of Naren and Hyman accepted this offer. The Township of Baldwin declined to meet with the staff of the MTO and Mines. MTO Member staff Algola also Manitoulin attended the Eastern Council order. meeting to help address questions related to the projects. On September 11th, representatives from the MTO and Mines attended a town hall to share information and answer questions about the project. Consultation has been done. Niobium, by the way, is a benign mineral that contains low levels of naturally occurring radiation. Niobium is not harmful to the human body. It is used to medical applications, providing support for bone Response. implants and plates and screws for broken bones and for security tools. Niobium is also used in things like cell phones and computer and high drives. Here, here. This is not an issue. Here. The next question. The member for Markham, Unionville. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Solicitor General. Okay. Ontario has seen a troubling rise in crime. This is particularly true in our major cities, including Markham, Unionville, the riding that I have the honour to serve. This increase in crime is having a profoundly negative impact on the safety, well-being, and the sense of security for our communities. The increase in violence, crime, drug-related offences and property and car theft is not only causing fear among residents, but also straining our law enforcement resources. Small businesses are struggling to cope with the financial losses due to theft, and many Ontarians feel unsafe in their neighbourhoods. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please outline that immediate actions our government is taking to support our constituents in addressing these growing concerns and what long-term strategies are being considered to reduce crime and enhance public safety across? Thank you. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend for the question. Mr. Speaker, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, will not stop in prioritizing our public safety, will not stop in fighting auto theft, will not stop in getting the illegal guns off our street, and will not stop in locking up violent and repeat offenders and put them where they belong in jail. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, our government made an announcement just a few weeks ago to further expand class, 
to further expand our class sizes at the Ontario Police College with an additional 80 spots that will help First Nations, medium and small-sized police services have the extra recruits that they need to keep their community safe. Priority for public safety will be there morning, noon and night for our government. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for your strong leadership. Ontario is grappling with rising crime rates, which are placing significant pressure on communities, local businesses, and law enforcement. The surge in violent incidents, organized crime, and property-related offenses is creating a climate of fear and insecurity in many neighborhoods. Families are concerned for their safety, while small businesses are struggling to recover from repeated theft and vandalism. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please outline what specific initiatives our government is implementing to curb crime in Ontario and what support is being provided to local authorities to address this growing public safety crisis? Well said. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to my colleague, thank you for the question. You know, the fundamental rights that we all have as Ontarians to live safely in our own homes and communities will never be compromised under the leadership of our Premier, Doug Ford. And I want to say this, Mr. Speaker, the other thing that our government has shown is respect. Respect to the people that put on a uniform every day. That respect, no matter the odds, no matter the threats, no matter the situation, they're bringing to their work each and every day their courage, their determination, and everything that they are in their DNA to keep Ontario safe. And that's why our government will be positive. Our government will make investments like at the Ontario Police College, like in grants to fight those who think it's okay to steal our cars, like at an additional bail and warrant apprehension grant. Response. And we're not stopping, Mr. Speaker. Public safety is our inherent right, and people can count on the leadership of Premier Ford to keep our communities safe. The next question, order. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Children in care across this province are still sleeping in hotel rooms, in Airbnbs. Workers are pushed to the brink, and children's aid societies have been in crisis for years. The minister recently announced an audit in the province's children's aid societies, as if that would be the golden solution to the crisis. The child welfare sector has been under review for over four years now with nothing to show for it. Hundreds of children have lost their lives in this broken system. The resources just are not there, even as the need grows. Premier, when will your government take responsibility for these children and youth in care and stop your failure of even delivering the basics? To reply, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear, but let me repeat it again. We want every child, every youth in this province to have a safe and loving home, regardless of their circumstance, here, here, Mr. Here. Speaker. And we have made investments to make sure that happens. Speaker, we invested $76.3 million in child welfare last year. We invested $14 million in child protection services this year. We increased that support by $36.5 million again this year, a base funding which is ongoing, all to make sure that every single child and youth in this province is protected and supported. And Mr. Speaker, we will never waver from that commitment. And if we see that, that, that things are falling through the cracks, yes, we will take action. This is the future of our province. We will never, Response. ever, ever waver from that commitment. Supplementary question. Keep this for the minister, just in case you didn't hear me. Kids are sleeping in hotel rooms. They are sleeping in Airbnbs. They are sleeping in children's aid offices. They are sleeping in the trailer in the back. Kids are dying. 354 children have died in the last three years. That's three, or that's one every three days. 
So can the minister guarantee us that this is not going to happen under his watch tonight? Members, please take their seat. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, myself, the Premier and this government, we've made it very clear we will never, ever stop Order. fighting for children and youth in this province. I mentioned the investments that we have made this year and last year, Mr. Speaker, in the, in, in the programs to make sure that every child and every youth in this province continues to thrive. But you know what happens, Mr. Speaker? The opposition will never talk about that. I'll talk about the investments in the programs to protect every child, every youth in this province, and that the fact that we will never give up on them. Order. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, the number, the number of children and youth in care has reduced by 30 per cent over the last 10 years, while the increased investments by nearly $130 million, Mr. Speaker. So yes, we want to make sure where the funds are going. Order. Yes, we want to make sure that every child, every Order. youth in this, in this province is order. protected, is supported, so that they continue to Respond. thrive and succeed in every single community. We will never, ever, ever waver from that commitment, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Stop the Members would please take their seats. We can restart the clock. Member for Oxford. Much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister of Forestry and Forest Products. Ontario's forestry sector plays a crucial role in supporting thousands of jobs in rural and northern Ontario communities, providing sustainable economic opportunities for families and contributing to Canada's environmental stewardship. However, the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is placing an undue burden on this industry. This unfair tax is increasing operational costs and undermining the sector's competitiveness in both domestic and international markets. Given the essential role that Ontario forestry sector plays in our economy, can the minister please explain how our government plans to address the rising cost imposed by the carbon tax, which threatens jobs and economic growth in this crucial industry. The Associate Minister of Forestry and Forest Products. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Oxford for that question. Speaker, the former Liberal government abandoned the forestry sector and strapped it with taxes and unnecessary red tape. As a result, the sector struggled, but with targeted investments made through our forest sector strategy has mounted a massive return. And now, despite the Liberal carbon tax systematically impacting the industry, it is our government that has extended the gas tax cuts to save the industry over $2.8 million wow. per year. Today, Ontario's forestry sector generates more than $18 billion for manufactured goods and services and supports more than 148,000 direct and indirect jobs. By cutting red tape, by reducing the gas tax, and with targeted investments, Ontario Response. is continuing to support our forestry sector and our northern Ontario workers. Here, here, Thank here. you. Two supplementary, back to member for Oxford. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is not only impacting the competitiveness of Ontario's forestry sector, but also threatening the long term sustainability of rural and indigenous communities that rely on these jobs. With higher transportation and fuel costs, mills are struggling, and we risk losing a sector that has been a cornerstone of our economy for generations. An added financial burden of the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is making it increasingly difficult for these businesses to stay competitive, leading to potential job losses and economic decline in these regions. How can the Trudeau Crombie Liberals justify one size fits all carbon tax policy that disproportionately harms the forestry industry? Speaker, can the minister, the associate minister, please tell us what concrete steps our government is taking to provide immediate relief Question. for this vital sector? Associate Minister of Forestry and Forest Products. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the, from the member or to the member from Oxford for that excellent question. I couldn't agree more. The opposition has no plan for the forestry sector, and we know the Liberals consider, consider Northern Ontario no man's land. Uh. 
Meanwhile, our government recognizes that building sustainable housing requires an advanced forest sector strategy and innovation. My ministry is well on its way to making Ontario once again a world leader in forestry and forest products. Here, here. For example, the Ontario government has provided close to $8 million in advanced wood construction projects, and we're investing an additional $60 million over the next three years in forest biomass facilities to turn products like the sawdust from a sawmill into alternative products like fuel, bioplastics, and furniture. Nice. Speaker, it's clear Response. it's our government that is standing behind our forestry sector, promoting innovation and sustainability. That Thank you. Said. Thank you. The next question, the member from Mishkigawak, James Bay. Monsieur le Président, ma question pour le ministre des Transports. Pendant des années, les députés de ce côté de la Chambre ont envoyé des conditions and when we sit on the side of the chamber, we know there are conditions and the dangers happening in the north. There was a survey by Marketplace which showed how dangerous it is and how many frauds are taking place and how deep of a systemic issue it is. It's like a cancer for the industry. My colleague asked a question, though the Premier responded the same. He responded to journalists. You know you've known for years what was taking place in this industry. What are the concrete steps to reassure the province and the people living in the north in Nunavut to face safety? People die. These deaths should not happen. There were dead people in Thunder Bay. I suggested a bill that would respond to the security needs. As I repeat, people died there. My question to the minister is, I'm asking you again, what are you doing to solve this situation, ensuring the safety of Ontarians on our roads? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We have zero tolerance for uh, any sort of fraud that is happening within the system, and we will come down very hard on them. Uh, that uh, member knows, uh, and as I have said in the past, uh, in the circumstances of any potential fraud, that has been uh, communicated to the OPP, and we are actively working uh, with them uh, on any of that. Uh, we have also terminated six uh, members that uh, uh, came upon through a uh, investigation that was conducted as well, um, and we'll continue to ensure uh, that we move forward in a way that protects the integrity of the system. We have some of the safest roads in North America, and we will continue to put forward bills in this legislature that improve upon that safety like we did in the past year, cracking down on impaired driving, cracking down on careless driving across this province. I hope the members opposite support this government, when we improve investments in highway safety, uh, safety, which they haven't in the past, in fact, voting against most recently a $30 million Bonds. investment in Thunder Bay to improve truck vehicle safety inspection centers. So I hope the members opposite start supporting this government in our investments in increasing enforcement officers and the infrastructure needed to protect people on our roads. It's a shame that they don't support that. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.